Hello, hello. I'm Jenny Motto. I'm a reporter with the LA Times. And I am so excited to moderate today's pre-screening panel discussion uh, with three incredible women. This intersection of science, technology, and film is one that really, really excites me, and we have a great lineup tonight. Um, I'm going to call them up right now. Uh, first, we have Diane Kruger, an actress, filmmaker, producer, <laughs> whose films include one of my favorite odes. Oh, yes. One of my favorite odes to cinema and Nazi busting <laughs> in Glorious Bastards. Hi. We have Daniela Chabrich, Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering at UCLA. <laughs> and we have Tracy Drain. <laughs> this is uh, her, one of her technical um, titles. Flight Systems Engineer for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But I will let her uh, explain the other <laughs> cooler, more badass title that uh, Thank that you. Also I do love my badass title. So I right now work on a mission, and I'm the deputy chief engineer for the Juno mission that's in orbit around Jupiter right now. I can't even say all these words. <laughs> so ladies, we have a lot to talk about, and yeah. we're going to talk about it for a long time. Uh, and before we get into the Hedy Lamar doc, which is really, really rich and fascinating um, and revelatory, um, here's just let's start with a little bit of background about Hedy Lamar and why she is such a good uh, thematic subject uh, to launch this conversation tonight. Um, most people know Hedy Lamar, the actress, Austrian actress, uh, as one of Hollywood's golden age megastars. Uh, movies such as Samson and Delilah, for example, but few people realize she was also a very brilliant inventor, a self-taught innovator, um, and some of her, her I guess, inventions uh, were patented. Daniela can speak more to that, um, as, as these very patents were then actually put into practice, which is kind of like a mind-blowing fact to know. Um, and Diane, you are deep into development of your own Hedy Lamar project. So uh, let's start with that. Like, what was it that, that sort of drew your attention to Hedy Lamar's story, for starters? How did you even know that there was a side of her? Um, to be honest, I didn't even know sh who she was. Um, I had never seen any of her films. And someone a long time ago sent me a very mediocre script. and. I couldn't believe what I was reading. Like the script was really bad, but like I, I, I just was like I can't believe the story of this, of this, of this lady. Who is she? And I started doing doing all this research. And um, I just thought, wow, we, 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 someone has to make this story. There's so much story there, and I, I personally was so attracted to the story because clearly I'm not a scientist. Um, but neither was she. What I loved about her was that she thought outside the box, and she was an inventor because she saw things differently. And, and I thought this is, this is the contribution that she's made to the world and how it stands today is, is so outstanding and so inspiring. Like, I want my daughter to be Hedy Lamar, you know? And so I want to tell a story. I want to honor her legacy. People need to know what she did. So speaking of what she did, it's, uh, there's this term, frequency hopping, which we will hear much more about in this film. But Danielle, please explain the science behind this. OK. So <laughs> first, I want to add like, uh, how I oh, yes. came to know about um, Hedy Lamar. So um, when I started uh, graduate school at UCLA, my project was to design fast frequency hopping system sponsored by Department of Defense. And we were actually the first one to demonstrate frequency hop system, actual hardware communicating radio signals um, based on frequency hopping technology. And I was supposed to write my master's thesis. And of course, I did the literature survey coming to the origin where the frequency hopping started. And I came across a book that actually stated that the frequency hopping was invented by Hedy Lamarr. And that was kind of a surprise to me, but at the same time, I just have to give another background. I work in the electrical engineering department, predominantly men, about 85%, almost 90%. At the time, I was the only girl in the lab of 10 graduate students. And here I come, so proud. <laughs> like, wow, I demonstrated the fastest frequency hopping to date based on the invention of Hedy Lamar, who also happened to be a woman. And that was kind of, wow. <laughs> so to this day, and I cannot explain you how 
when, when I actually heard, what is it, like 17 years later from uh, a producer asking me, do you know who is Hedy Lamar? I mean, he called and he said like, you know, I interviewed professors in electrical engineering and I was like, yes, I know who is Hedy Lamar. <laughs> So that was kind of um, interesting. But now coming back to her invention, and um, frequency copying is a technology in wireless communications world where I work in, is one of the foundational principles on how wireless spectrum, basically the medium that we use to send signals over the air without wires, <laughs> is used. And uh, her idea or, or her invention was uh, driven by the need to uh, enable secret communication. During World War II. Yes, during World War II. So why was frequency hopping so important? Well, when you are transmitting, and right now, luckily, we all use cell phones, we know what wireless communication is. We know that there is antenna that's transmitting, our antenna somewhere in our box is receiving. Well, if they happen to be on the same frequency, anyone can, in if they know that frequency, they can intercept the communication, meaning they can listen to that communication. That's okay. no good. That's no good mm -hmm. if you're trying to be secret. And her idea was actually to uh, become immune to jamming the signal of being intercepted. So he, she understood that. Actually, there was another part that, that kind of inspired her at the time, which was like 1941, I believe. There was the first remote controller that appeared. And I don't know how many of you really think about how does the remote controller work. We all have them, but wha what is the technology? Well, Hedy Lamar, 1941, thought about it. And she was like, I mean, to me, it's genius. Like, she understood that if you dial into the right frequency, they can communicate. If you switch the frequency, the communication is lost. But um, the idea is if the intended receiver knows how to move from one frequency to another, they will be able to keep up the communication. While the receiver that stays on one frequency one dial, we'll lose it. And that was kind of um, what was the guts of it. Now, I think the secret part was the main motivation, but I don't know how many of you know, frequency hopping is still used in today's technology. Luckily, we don't have any of the world issues that we have to deal with as civilians, but um, there, are, there is um, what we call multiple access technology, and that's basically that we can share these frequencies. For example, we are all familiar with Bluetooth, right? And I don't know if, you ha if you're in a car, how many of you can have wireless headphones that would communicate with your phone? And the idea is that all of these um, wirelessly connected devices can share the spectrum without coordinating. You don't have to tell your friend, you know, I'm on this frequency or another. By hopping, they're basically sharing this uh, medium very intelligently. And that's actually what enabled Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and many other technologies. And that's what blew my mind when I read about this, is that, oh my god, we have Hedy Lamar to thank in part for Wi-Fi that we are all on right now, probably, I'm sure, on our iPhones, um, and secure Wi-Fi, all sorts of com modern communication. Yeah. Tracy. Hi. Tell me about, like, when you, are you surprised to hear about, like, these sort of hidden geniuses emerging, like, you know, I am. So as a systems engineer, I'm a generalist. I know a lot about a, a, the different subsystems, telecom, thermal, whatever, but I don't go very deeply into one subsystem. And so I'm not familiar with the background of that technology. I had never heard of Hedy Lamar. I'm very much looking forward to seeing the documentary tonight. But in the same way, I had not heard of the figures from Hidden Figures either, even though during my undergrad years, I was an intern at NASA Langley in the late 90s, and I still had not heard about them. So I love the fact that we are now now seeming to be in a period where there's a lot of interest in these stories that have been kind of on the forgotten shelves of history and they're coming not just to books but as Doran says they're coming to theater they're coming to film so it's it's phenomenal to get to learn about all of these ladies from history and we are being very, a little spoiler uh, conscious to not spoil the story for you that you're about to see um, uh, but you're about you're, you will see a, a real comprehensive deep dive into Hedy Lamarr's life, um, how her background in Austria, how her marriage to a World War II munitions manufacturer had some part in sort of s giving her the seeds of knowledge um, that she would later use to develop this technology. 
Um, I love little tidbits like hearing that she was just so bursting with ideas that she invented uh, a, like a bouillon cube for, for Coca-Cola so that people serving overseas, like soldiers, wouldn't have to go without Coca-Cola. You just put a little cube, add water, and there you go. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, yeah, so um, uh, it's those, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to see how fully all the corners of her life really came together um, uh, throughout her life and throughout her work in many different ways. Diane, tell me more about the, the sort of connection that you feel to Hetty. Well, like I mentioned before, I'm, I'm, I'm German myself, so... Um, you know, I'm I'm interested in how she arrived in America. Her her incredibly free spirited um, woman. She was ahead of her time, and I I just I'm fascinated by how great she could have been had she gotten the opportunity. If she wouldn't have been a woman, you know, maybe people would have listened to her. Um, I I love her life. Um, you know, she was hailed as the most beautiful woman in the world, and nobody could believe that the actress of Samson and Delilah would invent frequency hopping. Or that she would care about things other than like... Other than what she looked like, and yet, you know, Howard Hughes gave her two of his engineers because he recognized how, how, what, how genius her mind was. And I'm just forever fascinated with her mind, and I love women. I want to tell stories about women that are so different than what you would expect, whether it's physical or just where they come from, what social background they have. Um, I wanted to ask everybody about sort of the idea of representation. These days, uh, I'm really grateful that representation, inclusion, diversity are conversations we are outwardly having, finally. Um, and it's stories like this that, that really sort of hammer home the importance of representation for little girls seeing what is achievable on the screens, in the movies that they're th shown, in the TV shows that they watch. Um, Tracy and I were talking about, because I couldn't resist talking about Star Trek with <laughs> a NASA engineer. Um, but and because Star Trek is awesome. Sorry, Star <laughs> Wars fans out there. Even though we disagree on our favorites, I'm a Deep Space Nine girl. <laughs> Tracy's a... Next generation. <laughs> We peacefully coexist on this <laughs> panel. I still love um, you. It's okay. But uh, the idea of like the 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 images that you saw when you were younger, sort of showing you what was possible. Do you feel that that was an element in your own background? Like you watched Star Trek growing up, and I did. And you know, it took me a long time to to form an opinion on that, even because you just don't pay attention to what's having an impact on you when you're a child, and you can easily, I know, I know that there are women and young girls who develop this idea that they should be things that are stereotypically female careers, and that it just doesn't even enter their mind to wonder what I like to be an engineer, what I like to be a scientist, and they may not feel like they're even missing anything because they just didn't consider those opportunities. Um, my mom told me the most adorable story. She's not a scientist or engineer, <laughs> but uh, she and her three sisters, they all watched the original Star Trek because Uhura was on TV. They're like, wow, there's a black woman on TV, and she's not a maid, and she's not a cook, and she's not a nanny. She's like a communications officer with Starfleet Hulk, and they would run home to go watch the show. And I think maybe part of that developed in my mom, this idea that women can be anything, and I was very lucky to grow up with her, always encouraging me in whatever I wanted to do, and never giving me even any unconscious nudges one way or the other, because I was born a female. Daniela, what about yourself? Um, I think there are two parts. One is that I think from the early age, um, I think through conversations with my dad particularly, who was a scientist, physics professor, I was kind of um, encouraged to think, ask questions. And, and I think that kind of um, spirit, you know, remained like, you know, I, I can, you know, try to figure out how this works. I mean, solve a math problem, solve, you know, a, a science project. And then, I mean, fortunately, I, I grew up in Serbia, which is kind of, um, at the time, I mean, women were, I would say, there equal as men. Like, we had working women there, and I actually happened to have uh, professors in my high school who were female and who, who were very, um, how would I say it? Um, they, they try actually to, 
to, if they saw a child who had interest and talent, to provide more. So they actually kind of had these special sections where you could have extra work and then um, they actually took us to these competitions, which were kind of national level and then we had the international level. And to be honest with you, for me, I felt like a celebrity. I mean, it was kind of strange, like, you know, being like, you know, number one at math competition in your city. Wow. And then you go Give you a sense of pride. <laughs> Give you yeah, a sense yeah. of pride. And actually, I was, I mean, I don't know, my parents were proud of me and then my teachers were proud of me. So it was that, um, I mean, there were male and female, there was no distinction, but then I was kind of, and there were other friends who were doing the same thing. So it was kind of, I, and I kind of I'm thinking in the US and having children growing up here, you, you want for them to feel from the very early on age, you know, curious, you want to give them opportunities and, and kind of, f if they're doing science or technology, you want for them to feel that that's important and it's, it's, it's a job that, you know, can, Fulfilling, that's right. So, I mean, that's kind of my, I mean, maybe it's not like general, but I felt that that was really the, and that opened other opportunities for me to come to United States and get scholarships to study at top universities. But um, it, it was kind of women actually that helped me throughout in, in, in this process and, and where I am today. That absolutely makes so sense. So that's the reason yeah. I, I have this call, like whenever I, I mean, in UCLA we have about 10 or 15 students 10 or 15 percent of female students, when they come to my office, I really want to kind of help them and mentor them and and want for us to succeed so that we have uh, more women. And I'm really happy that now I feel that there is a time, there is more movement that we see, uh, and and hopefully young girls will you know not wait till college to kind of decide whether to go or not into engineering, but you know have that as a as a kind of a career plan early on. Yeah, and Diane, growing up, what were the the things that you saw, the the art that you consumed, the the things that you know, like you saw as achievable uh, that made you sort of aspire? It, it was a little different, I, and one of the things that touched me the most about Hetty's story was her relationship with her father, because I grew up without one, and uh, I was incredibly moved by um, you know in those t times in Vienna in the, in the thirties. Um, he, she was really encouraged by her dad um, and, and encouraged to think for herself. And he, I think, taught her that anything she wanted, she could achieve, you know. And I, when I grew up, I went to um, actually a very scientific school and I rejected everything that had to do with scientific <laughs> fields, <laughs> which I now a little regret because I wanted to do artistic stuff, you know, and that was not encouraged. So um, I think it goes both ways, right? I think ideally each child gets gets to know or encouraged in what their interests lays, I guess, yeah. you know? But um, yeah, so Hedy, Hedy is a big, um, is, a, is really someone I look up to. And each of you, I was curious to, to have each of you share your personal experiences in your respective industries, um, just your perspective on the role that having more diverse sort of crews or staffs or teams around you has made in your, in your work that you've seen? I'll take a stab at that one. I know for us um, at NASA, when we are trying to develop spacecraft that are going out to new, you know, new, new civilization, <laughs> going out to explore places where we haven't sent spacecraft before, we're having to solve new technical challenges. Come you up went with new to science Jupiter. <laughs> That's right. It blows my mind. <laughs> we have to, we have to do, we have to break a lot of new ground. And if you have a, a set of homogenous minds that are all like from the same school, from the same background, thinking the same things, you're gonna miss a wide array of potential solutions to these issues where if you have people who come from different cultures and who have different genders and they're bringing all sorts of things to the party, you have a much higher likelihood of hitting on novel solutions that are gonna get you where you wanna go. So it's, it's of huge importance to us to have a very diverse workforce. Can you speak I to I think for, for engineers or like scientists and engineers, teamwork is becoming very important. Like it's very rare now that you work as an individual on a project. As she mentioned, there are teams. And 
I think we really need to make a difference. These teams have to be balanced. I don't think it's acceptable to have like one woman on the team and kind of fighting for her ideas and her voice is often not being heard or dismissed and whatever shyness she has or whatever, you know, it's not gonna come through her talent and you know her voice if we don't make balance. I mean, I just wanna bring another kind of exciting thing that I've seen at UCLA this last two years. Um, the girls, the very few girls we have created this group called WAT, Women Advancing Technology to Teamwork. And the, the, the accent is on teamwork. You know, when they work together, because they, they try to work on some other cl like clubs, I, you know, that we have at UCLA where the, and, and, and that made a huge difference. What they're doing with their projects and, and, and developing together is impressive. Now, that's the key, really. We have to make this balance. We have to kind of have more women participating and, and working together in a team, of course men and women together, but not like one or two, two <laughs> women in a team of 10 engineers. Yeah, and I think that's really valid for the entertainment industry as well, obviously. I mean, more and more it's happening, not enough, but I think, yeah. it, you know, the tide is changing. Yeah. Have you seen, like, do you feel like you've seen a difference in the last few many years? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. Especially, um, I mean, I'm European, so I feel like in Europe we have more female directors than in the US, but there's definitely been um, an attention to hiring more female directors, uh, getting girls to become directors, first of all, or, or occupying jobs that are not just, you know, the actress or uh, a producer. Like, we see more girls being grips or being a DP, you know, for sure. F female writers. I really want to hire as many women as I can for Hedy Lamar because I think she was such, a, such an example for women, and she needs to be told through a woman's eyes. I also love that you are developing it as a miniseries and not yeah. like a TV sh or a not, a, not a film because there's so much life. So much life. I, you know, I, that's been the hardest thing actually is how, where do you, I mean it's easy where you start. It's just like how much can you possibly tell, you know. Um, and for yourself, like producing, this is also a big, big <sighs> It's hard. Step. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure yeah. some people in this room. It's Mina. it's just it's long. Like when I first when I first optioned this book, you know, I think that was before Hidden Figures and before I feel like this renewed interest in science and, and women in science and people just didn't really want to make a female biopic, you know. It was just really, really, really hard and even though she was a well known woman. Yeah. Like people were like, Well, she's not Melania Dietrich, you know, that kind of thing. Um I mean, even that, nobody wants to make a biopic about that. I would watch that also. Yeah, well, but you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. just, it's, it's, nobody wanted to make it, and now it's um, really intensified. Um, you know, Google came on board to help us develop this because they have a huge interest in getting girls into science. Um, and uh, we, we have, for the first time, I think, ever incoming calls, people wanting to make this. Yeah. Yeah. And what is the current status of that project? I think we're very close to having, um, a, like, a re first of all, a real breakdown of the story, and and we have you know a studio who wants to make it, and we have, I think, we're very close to locking down the actual writer of it. So. And you are uh, planning on starring as well, right? It's the intention, yeah. Mm. So w as a performer, what is what what appeals to you about about portraying like about bringing her to life? Because she was so greatly complicated and contradictory, you know, like we all are, but hers are just so magnified because of her contribution and, and her legacy will live on, I hope, forever. And yet she was, as we all are, a very flawed human being. She was a great star. She was incredibly beautiful and, you know, she, she's everything that you want to see on come to life on screen, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Tracy and Daniela, I'm curious, as scientists, do you ever get mad at how television shows or movies depict your craft? I know, I wanna know <laughs> that too. <laughs> what can filmmakers do to avoid? Help me. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take a step. I've, I've actually been practicing with this question, right? I've been practicing at least recognizing that there are constraints on the storyteller because you're trying to tell a story. You yeah. can't like, jam every single factor. Okay. You, trust me, every pitch I have to make to a student, like, well, what's the invention? I'm like, it's frequency. I'm like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> Come with me to every meeting. 
because like the, here's the actress trying to be like, well, you know, in Bluetooth on phones. So I was yeah. like, you know. I'll give you an example just from computers because I know, like, take take TV for example. It's very visual, and when you're even when you're listening to dialogue, you're watching people do things. You you want to see some kind of visualization of the action going on. So when people are talking about coding, for example, and they're and they're trying to hack something, and there's like all the stuff scrolling by, and they're looking at it. I'm like, D no, <laughs> it totally doesn't look like that. But I but I get it from a um, filmmaker's perspective. You, you have to show something to create drama. So I think as w when people are trying to be factual but need to take some liberties for the screen, totally understand that. So when you watch Hidden Figures and you know they're doing all this math on the on the yeah. thing, is that actually correct? Because I look at them like, okay, it's numbers, you know, yeah, it must so, be. So I just heard behind the scenes information that they really tried their best to have the correct equations up there. <laughs> they and tried their best. They but did. Was it? Well, and, well I'm, I'm not a navigator, oh, so okay. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my understanding is that it was very, very good. And poor Taraji had to make Memorize all of this. I know. <laughs> and, that's and what I kept had thinking. To do it while saying, <laughs> while talking to it, and so they, they brought people on to try to teach her what the equations were, <laughs> and she's like, no. <laughs> so she ended up just memorizing them wrote. But cue like, yeah. cards, please. <laughs> right. Daniela. Yeah, I think. I mean, I don't actually. I mean, I watch movies, but not that many movies. So I don't recall a, a, a movie where I could see like a life of a scientist that looks like, you know, people that I know, <laughs> let's say, or who are scientists like me. Maybe that, I mean, I guess in movies you need to kind of add more of a <laughs> <laughs> interesting story, but it would be nice, I mean, for, um, I mean, talking about inspiring, you know, girls and kids in general to work on technologies, like usually if they have a parent or, or someone close by so they can get inside, what is the job like? Mm. But isn't it like, when they watch TV and like watch a movie about this person that des does science and has these great discoveries or inventions, I mean, I, to me that's kind of real and could be inspiring. I mean, I don't know. As I said, I don't watch that many movies, but I haven't seen. I mean, one. Um, I understand that the technology on CSI is not real, and so. Computers can't just like pull up all sorts of <laughs> things on a screen, which oh is oh man, you're breaking my <laughs> dreams here, really. What? I don't know. You're the, you're the what you're about the Star filmmaker. Trek? <laughs> Star Trek's real, right? Star Trek's totally real. <laughs> 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 the thing about Star Trek that's cool is it inspired so many of people of my generation to go be engineers and develop technology because Star Trek has self has phones that aren't attached to the wall. How come we can't have cell phones, right? I thought I thought I heard that the people who helped invent the cell phone were really like we want communicators. So it's that whole reverse inspiration. <laughs> it's pretty cool. You know, it's interesting. Actually, I had a girl last week from. I think she's Korean, she came and she's freshman. So this is like at UCLA, fourth week of classes. And she came for advising hours and I, she was very nice and I asked her at the end, like, why did you decide to become engineer? She says, when I was young, I watched this cartoon and there was this girl, she <laughs> made some artificial hand that helped uh, a, a person do certain things like magic and she thought that's so cool. <laughs> like, you know, maybe one day she wants to kind of design this um, hands. Yeah. <laughs> Make <laughs> it for real. Yeah. So it was like a cartoon, not even a movie, yeah. that inspired a girl and she was like, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think that, that films, movies, cartoons that show what is possible with engineering is very inspiring. And I also, one of the reasons I'm excited about the Haley Lamar story is because you can break out of the stereotype that a scientist or an engineer is someone who's just locked in their lab all the time and they just play with chemicals or circuits and that's it and they have no life but you can be a beautiful woman actress and have cool ideas and and make inventions or you can be an engineer who does you know dancing or singing there's there's you don't have to become a person who's not the self you already are just yeah. because you're taking on a job that's in a technical field i think yeah. that's true of people who have any kind of job lawyers whatever that's what inspired me the most i will say that she was just she wasn't an engineer she just thought differently you know because as, as we see in the film like she comes from a much more free sort of place they were intellectuals though yeah. but they yeah they were you know they they her dad was giving her books to teach I mean to read and well, she her was first a, film well yeah I think that broke his heart we shall see that yeah but um I, I, but I love that too, you know, I think that when girls are encouraged, and especially by their dads, there's something about that, I don't know, maybe I'm just dreaming about that, but I think it's a really, that's really great, you know. 
Um, and tell me, from your perspective, um, how important is it to have these stories being told by women? I mean, Hedy, Hedy Lamar's uh, story, for example, um, is one in which she was subjected to the male gaze for her entire career. So to have that sort of subverted, um, or at least opened up from a female perspective, I think, sees a lot more. I, I don't know how to answer that because I, th I think I, as much as I always want to champion women, at the end of the day, I believe that the best person should direct or write something, you know, and ho I'm hoping that would be a woman, but, you know, I don't want to just hire somebody because she's a woman because I think women are better than that too, you know what I mean? So, but, but I will say, to your point, she seemed to have not been able to get where she wanted to in her life because of being held back by a male stereotype that they had of women. So it would be really great to hire a woman who would, you know, tell her story from that perspective. I don't want to spoil the movie, but I think that Alexandra Dean did a fantastic job. Yeah, and did. I think the angle that she put as a woman, I think made a difference. I, I don't, I mean, as I said, I don't want to spoil it, but they're actually, to me, very, true and real and at the same time sad parts about Hedy's life that I think she as a woman, sorry, could have understood better just because of, of the nature. And I think that helped, as she said, like, you know, just at the end being real, like mm -hmm. I'm an engineer, I'm a woman, I'm a mother, I'm a, s you know, all these things that, um, you know, aging and, and, you know, being in, in, a, in a profession that has certain, you know, imbalances, I would say, <laughs> I think seen by a woman, I think in this case made a difference. I mean. Maybe. <laughs> maybe, I, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah. There is one, one story about Hedy Lamar. I don't remember if it's in the film or not, or about how uh, uh, she and her partner took the um, frequency hopping patent to the United States government trying to help them and, and she was basically turned away. She I heard this story. I think it might have been on Karina Longworth's Amazing podcast, you must remember this. I highly recommend listening to that. She has an entire Hedy Lamar episode. Um, it's really f fantastic. Um, but Hedy may have been ready to give up Hollywood to, to help the cause, of the wartime cause, by contributing her, her brain. She would have. She, she sold more, than more war, bo uh, war bonds than anyone. She really would have, I think, you know. And she was told uh, to instead help out by selling war bonds uh, using your celebrity instead of using your mind. I think the story is that all the all those men in Washington had s had seen ecstasy just before, right before she uh, took the meeting. So they were all thinking they were going to see some, you know, free spirited, yeah. titty model, or you know. Well, I think we are about ready to, you guys, if you haven't seen Ecstasy, then you're literally about to see what we're talking about in like five minutes. Um, Which uh, by today's standard is like, you know, I it's don't know. The, it's the racy <laughs> Hedy Lamar movie, uh, which I would very much like to see. Um, but we're about to watch this film. I want to thank our panel of amazing women tonight, here tonight. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me.